If you're a facilities manager at a warehouse and your HVAC system goes down, it can turn up the heat, literally. But don't sweat it, Granger has you covered. Granger offers over a million industrial grade products for all your operations, including warehouse HVAC maintenance. And even better, they offer access to experts and fast delivery, so you and your warehouse can both keep your cool. Call 1 800 Granger, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. Welcome to the sports moment from the Washington Post, your ticket to the Summer Olympics. It is Tuesday, August 6th, and I'm Ava Wallace, a sports reporter here in Paris. Today, I'm joined by two Post sports columnists, Jerry Brewer and Candace Buckner. We are talking about U.S. women's basketball as they enter the knockout rounds, a surprise American gold medalist in cycling, and at the end of the show, we've also got a behind-the-scenes segment about how sound design happens at the Olympics. That's right, they're putting microphones underwater. Good morning, Jerry. Welcome back. Good morning. Thanks for having me again. Ooh, bringing that 8 a.m. energy. I love it. Hi, Candace. Thank you for joining us. Cool. Wow. <laughs> hey, thanks for having it's me. It's going to be Appreciate like that. It. <laughs> okay. Uh, before we get into anything, let's do the metal table. Here is where things stand as of about 8 a.m. this morning in Paris. The United States and China are tied for first place with 21 gold medals each, still tied. The U.S. leads in the overall medal count with 79. And France and Australia are tied for third with 13 medals each. Okay, speaking of medals, the gymnastics meet ended yesterday and Simone Biles, Jordan Childs, and Rebecca Andrade from Brazil were on the podium at the floor routine. So Rebecca Andrade took gold, Simone Biles took silver, and Jordan Childs took bronze. Jerry, you were at the gym yesterday. I wrote about it in... The newsletter that I do, The Sports Moment, I know you wrote about it in your column, but that bow that the two Americans, Simone Biles and Jordan Childs, gave to Rebecca Andrade when she took her first gold at these games. Can you tell me what that scene was on the podium there? Incredible moment. Uh, Women supporting women, specifically uh, black women supporting black women. Simone Biles called Rebecca Andrade a queen. They wanted the world to realize, look at these three Black women on the podium. This is a historic moment. but The first all-black Olympic podium ever. Yes, in gymnastics. Mm-hmm. And they also had a deep respect for Rebecca. I mean, this is, imagine having three ACL knee surgeries coming back and being a world-class gymnast who can push and then finally on this stage beat Simone Biles. I mean, it's an unbelievable story, all that she's been through, the Brazilian gymnast who now has six Olympic medals. Candace, you've been out to gymnastics a lot. This crowd we think of as a crowd, at least from a U.S. perspective, as people who pull for Simone Biles and are, and are there cheering on the Americans. But when you're at gymnastics, it's not like that. It's kind of like everyone's cheering for everybody. And yesterday on the podium, people were chanting her name, Rebecca, Rebecca. People are kind of just cheering for people doing good performances. Yeah, because the gymnastics me, it's like there's no one really on the spotlight, mm-hmm. truly, except when you're on floor. It's so, all happening at once. Like yeah. people are on the bars, people are on the beam. Someone could be on uneven bars almost breaking their neck and there's <laughs> whoa because somebody finished a vault. Yeah. But yeah, it's it's constant cheering, constant energy. And I'm, I'm I wish I would have caught that moment. That would have been <laughs> you haven't seen it? Well, oh well you've it seen live. it since. Yeah, live, yeah, yeah. 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 Live it was really it was um it was pretty moving, which was funny because I feel like I wrote it in this like very weighty way because it definitely meant a lot to me. But when you watch them do it, it's kind of like Jordan Childs just like catches Simone's eye. She like motions that they're going to bow. Simone kind of gives her a smile. It was, it was almost like playful. It was very light and easy to them, which is not what you see often from a competitor who also wears a uh, diamond encrusted goat necklace. Yeah, for Simone, you wondered how she was going to react. You know, yesterday was her toughest day at the Olympics. Uh, she finished fifth on the balance beam, fell off the beam like so many other competitors. They were really upset that in the arena they had made it a really quiet environment. They were, hmm. you know, they wanted noise. 
which I can understand. Like, I don't want, you don't want to hear like your arms and feet and everything on that beam when it's so small. I mean, it's ridiculous. But they were all upset, all the competitors, and half of them made major mistakes. And so making that podium was just about being able to get across that thing, not about a uh, degree of difficulty in, in this particular meet. Uh, so disappointing fifth. Uh, it's the first time that Simone had made an Olympic final and not medaled. Hmm. And it wasn't the way she wanted to end the Olympics, but you could just tell how much Simone is in a healthy place because of the way that she reacted. I think she's glad the Olympics are over. If I had to make a prediction, I would say within two years, she's probably going to retire the way that she was acting, but she left open the possibility that she could be in L.A. in 2028 at the preposterous old. age at 31. <laughs> I can't imagine that myself, 31. Wow. Um, okay, the other thing I was kind of watching yesterday was Mondo de Plantas, the Swedish-American pole vaulter who represents Sweden. Won gold yesterday, set another world record at 6.25 meters. I loved afterwards online, I was saying I watched the pole vault, but then afterwards a tweet emerged that he and Shakari Richardson, who both ran at LSU, actually arrived at LSU. Did you guys see this? On the same day. So they have a, they, they're both sitting there like somewhere at LSU sitting like, welcome to college. And they're holding like my first day at LSU signs. And they just look like totally themselves, but babies. And I, I really love that. Candace, have you been out to the track yet? I was there last night. How was it? I was watching the pole vault mm -hmm. until it was drama. Tell me about it. Drama on the oval. <laughs> okay, so it happened in the women's 5,000 meters. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm from St. Louis, y'all. Excuse me if I mispronounce these names. But the Kenyan runner. Faith Kipyogan. Kip, Faith Kipyogan. Mm -hmm. And the Ethiopian runner, who's a world record holder in the 5,000, good off Segai, got into a little bit of a Jocelyn match <laughs> while they were trying to break free. Say guy comes in, you know, one space, gives her like the little people's elbow. Yeah, there's strategy to these runs. But Faith was like, no, nah, I'm not having it. And Josh puts her short back. So when Faith and her teammate, Bernice Sherbe, I'm so sorry, y'all, public school. They, when they're <laughs> coming down the runway, they're coming down the straightway, they're finishing first and second, Bernice mm -hmm. and Faith. Then after the race, the officials are like, no, Faith, you're disqualified. She had her silver medal stripped. Oh my gosh, stripped. I completely missed this. Whoa. Yeah, it was stripped for about two hours. And then they reinstated her. So she had her silver back. Wow. For a moment there, it felt like a woman was like going to have her heart broken. And Goodness. I watched her go through the media zone. She was crying into so her country's flag. So she was disqualified flag. and then went through the media zone and then had it reinstated. Did she go back no, and no, talk she, to people afterwards? No, she she had to get ready for her next race. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> it's, these runners, and there's another runner, Safan Hassan from the Netherlands. She's going to run the 10,000 mm -hmm. and then the marathon. So she's only building mileage throughout these Olympics. These long distance runners, they're half crazy, but they are <laughs> all strength. Yo, it's crazy. I am not building mileage. I am decreasing mileage as we speak. <laughs> right. After the break, we are going to get into some U.S. women's basketball. At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done. At Ashley, you'll find colorful furniture that brings your home to life. Ashley makes it easier than ever to express your personal style with an array of looks in fun, trending hues to choose from, from earth tones to vibrant colors to calming blues and greens. Ashley has pieces for every room in the house in the season's most sought-after shades. A more colorful life starts at Ashley. Shop in-store online today. Ashley, for the love of home. Okay, so let's get to the Americans. 
They went 3-0 and in group play, compiled a plus 58-point differential, are the top seed entering the quarterfinals, and will play Nigeria, which became the first African team to make it to that stage in the Olympic tournament. So, Jerry, can you set the table for us first? Tell me how big of a dynasty the U.S. women's basketball team is. They're going for their eighth straight gold medal, but kind of set up their reputation on the world stage, what the Olympics means to this program, everything like that. I think you could make a very strong case that it is the most dominant tradition at the Summer Olympics among team sports. Hmm. Their sense of mission, the purpose, the the superstars, the commitment from everyone who's eligible to play for Team USA, it's incredible. And you have to put it hand-to-hand with professional women's basketball. American WNBA stars believe that winning the Olympics continues to grow their game. There wouldn't be a WNBA if not for what happened in 1996, which was maybe the greatest women's basketball team ever assembled, and they got it done. And ever since then, we've had professional women's basketball, and they've stayed committed to the program. It is the hardest team at the Olympics to make. Yeah, there is with a lot of big, certainly U.S. programs, and I just say that because those are the ones I've reported on, but just such a sense of duty, and that sense of duty is really amplified when you're on a women's team where you're trying to also grow your sport and, and attract new people, which the Olympics is such a good moment for that. I mean, there are a lot of familiar faces on this team. You've talked about Diana Taurasi. You've also got Asia Wilson and Brianna Stewart, two WNBA MVPs, Jewel Lloyd, Sabrina Ionescu, Kelsey Plum. It's, I mean, it's just a loaded roster. And we can't talk about the team without talking about the Caitlin Clark drama. And who is who is not on the roster? <laughs> okay, so Candace, you've written about Caitlin Clark extensively. Of course, the basketball player who rose to fame as the center of Iowa's program and has kind of been a little bit of a firestorm since she's entered the WNBA. Um, can you summarize just what happened when the roster choices came out earlier this summer? What happened? People that I respect in this industry lost their minds. Okay. So I'm pro CC at this point in my age and stage. I want to go to events in which I have fun. And when Iowa came to Maryland this year, I had the most fun I had at that point at a sporting event. Wow. I was working, but I had fun. Yeah, she's going to grow the game. She's going to be the face of this league. I'm for that. But when the conversation starts shifting from they need her. And the conversation was in, she was left off the roster. In these Olympics, they need her. Yeah. They don't need her to win A. And the discussion about growing the game, sure, I know some of those crowds in Lille, France, <laughs> were not the best. Which is where the basketball tournament happened before the quarterfinals. The north of France. Right now, I think the conversation is disrespectful that they need her to even sell out an arena in the North of France. Right now, for these three weeks, it's about winning a gold medal. I understand growing the game and building up their pockets, but let's get the gold medal, which they will, and forget about everything else. For right now, let the best players who deserve their spot have their shine. And I also think we got to to factor in, you can't equate an American crowd with Caitlin Clark to France. Like, do we know for a fact that Caitlin Clark is really like that in France? Do we know for a fact that people who are coming to the Olympics who have all these options would have gone all the way to Lille just to watch her play? I I think there's a lot of layers to the Caitlin Clark conversation, and we only want to talk about the most oversimplified thing. Mm. And we need to talk about the main thing. And the main thing, once again, the American men's players – could not win the gold medal, not going to affect the NBA's growth. Mm -hmm. If the American women don't win the gold medal, everyone starts talking about the WNBA. And so these two things are entangled in a way that's unfair, puts a lot of pressure on them. But the main thing is the main thing. They have to get that gold medal. And Jerry, what you're alluding to there is the oversimplified part is the fact that Caitlin Clark, this white woman who is coming into a league populated mostly by black women, and now the conversation is turns to, oh, this program, this league needs this 
young mainstream appealing white woman to kind of save them and to bring the crowds and everything like that. And that's why it's such a sensitive topic is because it goes immediately there. And WNBA, I mean, it's not something that we made up. WNBA players talk about it all the time. It's, it's, that's a very real thing. Okay. I want to leave the basketball conversation there. And Candace, I want to ask you about a couple columns you've written recently that I've loved reading. First one about the surprise American gold medalist, Kristen Faulkner. You're a cyclist yourself. That must have been a really cool one for you to watch. I feel like thank you for you know pumping up my ego to call me like a <laughs> you're, you're, you too compete I, in the Olympics I at, ride at road bike. race, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, but I mean yeah. you're you're out there, you're pretty serious. I was I had, you know, all this color for yeah. Kina. Faso runner was leading the race at the beginning. These Afghani sisters who are representing their country, even though they're it's illegal for them to mm-hmm. to be uh, athletes in their country. So I had all this material about women in the world of cycling. And then Christian Faulkner is like, you know what? I'm just going to go ahead and turn <laughs> this into a good old America race. But it was it was super cool to watch. And you did not expect her. She was not supposed to even be here. She was not supposed to win this race, and she did. Cycling is like the weirdest sport where competitors actually work together to um, either break away from the pack or chase the pack. Can you explain to me how that happens? <laughs> yeah, so basically the Simone Biles of cycling, Marion Voss, was leading the group around um, around the like the end, but Christian and another racer wanted to close that gap. And they were closing in a minute to 40 seconds to 10 to 6. They had to work together. One gets in front, starts, sets the pace. And then after, you know, getting some fatigue, the other one gets in front. And these are athletes from, di- it wasn't a Different, Team USA no, teammate. No, they just worked together to close the gap. And then once the group of four um, got within, I would say, like the last two or three miles, Christian was like, you know, I'm going to go ahead and go out. And she built that gap while the other three were literally looking at each other on their bike. (laughs) Are you going to go out and set this pace so we can go chase her? No. Are you going to do it? No. She was gone. It was uh, it was amazing to see. Okay, I love that. Let's leave it there. Thank you guys for joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Ava. (laughs) Love being here. You're the best. (laughs) <laughs> Candace Buckner and Jerry Brewer are both sports columnists for The Post. We've got one last segment for you today. If you've never thought about sound design when watching a sporting event, I hadn't either (laughs) until the Sports Moment producer Ted Muldoon and I talked to Carl Malone, who's been a sound designer for the Olympics since 2004. He's now a senior director of audio engineering and sound design at NBC Sports and Olympics. He talked to us about how his team makes the games come alive for everyone watching at home. There's a presumption that there's just a microphone on a camera looking at a gymnast, but in actual fact, we're actually connecting probably 40 or more microphones on different parts of the apparatus. For example, we use a lot of boundary mics lining the Volt Run. So that's a, a small microphone that's usually used on stages for theater. They lie very flat to the ground and pick up the acoustic sound of running along the runway. We're trying specifically to get the sounds of the hands and the feet and as much as we can, the contact on something like the pommel horse. Yes, sir. Also on the parallel bars and being able to hear the wood and the creak of the wood. as well as the turnbuckles on the rings, where you can actually hear the the metal as it tightens. (laughs) 
a lot of the sounds that we do, people don't notice them. We used to talk about having the best seat in the house, like that was what every audio sound designer for television said. But sometimes there's a lot of things. If you're sitting in a stadium watching gymnastics or a soccer game, you're not going to hear the details on the track or they wouldn't necessarily hear the scream of the shot putter. So what we're trying to do now is actually give people the point of view, not only of the best seat in the house sitting in the crowd, but also to give people the details that the athletes hear. And I always say great sounds make the picture look better. I think swimming is probably my favorite summer sport. Take your marks. We use some underwater microphones in, in swimming and diving. They're basically uh, waterproof microphones on the bottom of the pool. So a lot of times when our director cuts to the underwater shot for the swimming turn, mm -hmm. we'll just dip out some of the crowd and fade up this underwater mic. So it gives the impression that I'm underwater. That you're drowning. Wow. <laughs> okay, you said it more dramatically. <laughs> you know, I'm always saying, can you make the swimming sound a little bit more wet? Because the biggest <laughs> thing that we have now is we just have so much more crowd. 2018 was the last time that we actually had crowd in mm -hmm. an Olympic stadium, and that was Pyeongchang. There's been two games, Tokyo and Beijing, where we had no crowd. There was a time during COVID when everybody started to think about, well, should we be adding crowd sound to the mix? And we decided not to do it, to be true to the event. It was a time in history. All those microphones that you could hear, and you could hear a lot of them, we focused in on those. I do remember one of our commentators. And he's just really gotten into a nice rhythm and you can hear it. You were talking just about being that. so Patrick. emotional about the noise of that slap of the, of the swimmer. It's just beautiful. I hate to say that I'd like to record it and have it put me to sleep. Because, I mean, we're in the middle of a race, but it is just such a beautiful sound. Well, they're just the sounds that you wouldn't be able to hear if there were 15,000 people inside the Tokyo Aquatic Center. And while we would love to have them all here and cheering along, uh, there are, this would be one of the small benefits of, of a lack of crowd noise. Now we have the crowd back. The having the crowd back has, I think everybody has missed it. And we're trying to maintain those details, but then bring the passion and the energy that the crowd bring to the broadcast. It's just brought so much emotion back. Take your marks. The crowd interaction with the swimmers is, is always amazing. They, they, even with Marchand, the French swimmer this, this year in, in Paris being a lo the local hero, they're doing breaststroke, they pop their head up and you hear the crowd go, way, way, way. I think Paris is definitely the best ending games that we've ever done. You create the emotion with the audio. I mean, the picture doesn't give you the emotion. The commentators can tell you and the reporters can tell you what's going on. But if you're looking at a sports event with just a very far microphone, you know, you have no real connection with the sport. Mm. You need to get closer and just give people things that they've never heard before from a sport. The audio clips in that segment were courtesy of NBC Sports. And before we go, here are a couple of events worth checking out today. Just to note, as usual, all these times are in Eastern time. In women's soccer, the United States plays Germany in the semifinals at 12 p.m. In track and field, medals are awarded in a session that begins at 1.35 p.m. And that includes the men's 1500 meter final, which is a very juicy race featuring bitter rivals Josh Kerr and Jakob Ingerbritsen, and the women's 200 meter final, that's when American Gabby Thomas races. 
In men's basketball, the United States plays Brazil in the quarterfinals at 3.30 p.m. Eastern, and Canada and France face off in the quarterfinals. Canada's definitely a favorite to win that game. That's at 12 p.m. Eastern. That's it for today on The Sports Moment. If you're tuning in via Post Reports, I'll be bringing you more coverage of the Paris games throughout the week until the closing ceremonies. Go follow The Sports Moment show feed wherever you're listening. Today's episode was produced and mixed by Ted Muldoon. It was edited by Joe Tone. I'm Ava Wallace. Until next time from Paris. At your job, do you ever have to deal with a nose roller? How about a snub pulley? Well, if you're installing a new conveyor belt system, dealing with the different components can sound like you're speaking a foreign language. Luckily, you've got a team ready to help. Granger's technical product specialists are fluent in maintenance, repair, and operations. So whenever you want to talk shop, just reach out. Call, click Granger.com, or just stop by. Granger, for the ones who get it done.